Yeah. All right. So what is um, the origin of Nowruz? Tell us a little bit yeah, about well, it. Nowruz literally means new day. And uh, this is a celebration that is uh, at least been officially uh, celebrated for 2,500 years. There's a detailed account of it by Xenophon, who was a uh, uh, who's one of the you know very very early Greek historians who fought uh, for a Persian king? He was a, as a, with Spartans, uh, so it's been at least officially celebrated for two thousand five hundred years. It's basically a form of a spring festival, which is very common across uh, cultures, especially in northern hemisphere, and it has its roots probably in a. a in, in in the time where Iranians were mostly nomads and pastoral, and they weren't living in settled places, and therefore they didn't have temples or they didn't build cults or images, so they would find the divine, they would find the spirits in nature, and uh, you see a lot of natural symbols uh, with Nuru associated with Nuru. So it's uh, and. In, in Zoroastrianism, which becomes Iran's official religion pre-Islamic times during the uh, during the third Iranian Empire, Sasanian, it, beco it, it becomes increasingly uh, more of a religious festival. It's uh, and Zoroastrians uh, across the world in India, in many places, celebrate it in a slightly different and more religious way. Because in Zoroastrianism, oh, oh, I, I believe all the days or most of the days are holy and associated with a certain spirit but this is the holiest of all uh, and uh, this is uh, by the way this is in iran we don't it's not celebrated uh, like christmas or like uh, the, you know uh, gregorian new year you wait for a specific time when the uh, spring equinox happens which basically means from uh, on the first day of the spring and the first day of the new year, no rules, uh, the daytime and nighttime, they are equal to each other. And as days pass, as we enter spring, daytime starts to grow and nighttime starts to shrink. And uh, that's why this day was extremely important to, the, to these people. And, you know, you see a lot of symbols to do with rejuvenation of earth, you know, you know, coming back, uh, nature coming back uh, alive and all that. So its original roots are probably in animistic and pagan beliefs of nature, worship and that kind. But over time it became more centralized, more religiously associated. And then you have the post-Islamic period where it is briefly suppressed to an extent. Uh, but then... Uh, uh, but. Uh, then it is sponsored by many Muslim, many foreign dynasties. I see. Very interesting. So that was, can, is there anything more about, because we're going to talk a lot about the customs associated with it, but is there more of like the historical background that you want to add and share? Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, as I mentioned, during the ancient times, it becomes a sort of a, it, it was a very important celebration, but we are not sure if it was the most important celebration because we also had Mehregan, which was the autumn equinox, uh, which that was an extremely important celebration as well. Uh, during Islamic times, as I mentioned before, it's slightly suppressed and heavy taxes are levied uh, during those times on Persian cities. But um, this is during largely during the first two caliphates which don't last for too, too, too long. And uh, in, uh, I believe in 18th century or in 19th century, if I'm not mistaken, uh, let me check. Yeah, in 18th century, uh, you have what is uh, in historically referred to as Abbasid revolution. And uh, Abbasid come to power and take over the caliphate. Abbasid are far more, they, first of all, they come to power with the help of Persian generals and Persian populace, most famously Abu Muslim, somebody who they uh, uh, immediately get rid of. And uh, uh, they have, uh, within their administrations, there are prominent Persian families, Persian Dehan families, or for Persian uh, former Persian aristocratic families, uh, like uh, Barmakyan, which were Persian Buddhists living in Afghanistan, and they pretty much take over 
the whole of bureaucracy of Abbasid. So Abbasid are far more, uh, let's say, international or multicultural. Uh, and this is basically this is the time that the political power within the Islamic world shifts from the hands of Ar Arabic tribes to uh, Arabs that are more settled and more settled people like Iranians and Turks that are uh, nomadic Turks, to be fair, that are coming in. So uh, with Abbasid, you, you know, they started sponsoring Nowruz and they hope, you know, this is a festival that they support and it's used for, you know, uh, showcasing their power as well. After that, you have a period of basically decline of the caliphate and you have all these uh, independent rulers uh, uh, coming to power in Iran, Safarid, uh, uh, Samanid, all of them, and they heavily uh, sponsor Persian arts and culture and festivals, including uh, including the Iranian New Year. Uh, you know, uh, you have so basically these local kingdoms that come to power quickly after that. Basically, in 12th century, uh, sorry, in 10th century, I believe. Yes, in 10th century, uh, Turks who were uh, slaves to basically the a slave here does not mean the same slave as uh, it is in America. Sl these were basically a slave mercenary armies, right? And Turks, uh, Seljuk Turks, were the slave mercenaries of other uh, Iranian and Turkic groups, but then they start rising in power and they take over all of Iran, Anatolia, they revived the old great empire, basically. Uh, but unlike the Arabs, they don't suppress uh, Iranian culture or, you know, Iranian uh, traditions and Iranian customs. And in fact, they very much are sponsored. Uh, this is very obvious from the names of their children that they, they name them usually after characters in Shahnameh, uh, Shahnameh, which is the Iranian book of mythology. It's a collection of pre-Islamic Iranian mythologies and Iran's foundation myth and including No Ruz's foundation myth, which is uh, is about a king uh, Jamshid that uh, saves all mankind from a winter that's going to kill everybody. So that's the mythological origins of No Ruz. So uh, Turks are very much in love with all of that and they sponsor uh, Persian and Iranian uh, language and customs and all that. Uh, following Turks, this is by the way about Turks are the Seljuks are the group that are. This is about the same time that his Crusades are going on in Europe. So if you know that may help to give it a bit of a time. Then you have the Mongols coming in, and Mongols uh, uh, just like Turks are. Uh, very much tolerant of local faith and, uh, you know, very tolerant of Persian faith and wherever else they go, to be honest, largely, as long as people are basically obeying them, they have no problem with local faith. So uh, they, they, they are, again, very much fans of, you know, Shahnameh and Iranian costumes and Iranian traditions. They sponsor them and they, you know, help to keep them alive in many ways. Following the collapse of Mongol Empire, you have Tamburlaine, uh, Timur, that is the great conqueror, the last great conqueror, probably. He comes to power in Central Asia and Iran. And he also, again, pays lip service to Iranian traditions. He even uh, uh, probably forges a fake ancestry that connects him to the ancient Iranian kings. And again, him and the rulers he ruled over, because at that time, uh, Iran was fragmented uh, among different rulers that were all loyal to Timur. Uh, he allows a lot of, you know, uh, uh, he allows for Iranian celebrations to continue. And uh, even though he was, you know, all of these rulers that we are talking about, including Mongols, they were all Muslims, uh, but they were also fans of, you know, no rules and Iranian customs and traditions. Following uh, uh, Timur, what you have again is a period of instability and infighting and all that. And then you have the emergence of the Safavid state. And Safavid state in medieval times is largely seen as the, basically as the predecessor to the Iran's modern nation state, which comes about during Qajar era, basically. So uh, Safavid state uh, is a very, uh, Safavid and Buyid, to be honest, uh, before them, uh, they were very much uh, heavily 
the sponsors Nowruz celebrations. They bring them back. They associate them with number of traditions, uh, uh, and like uh, they had very extreme beliefs in sort of uh, superstitious beliefs, you could say. And you know they connect them to Nowruz and all that. For example, uh, th there was this tradition that five last five days of the year, I believe, a uh, just court jester would become the king instead of the actual king and parade the city. So during the Safavid era, you have a very significant re-emergence of Iranian values and Iranian traditions and celebrations through the state sponsorship, not just, you know, uh, and, and a mixture with hardcore Iranian Shia beliefs that were basically, uh, that were Safavid beliefs that would uh, become, uh, you know, become, dominate the whole country. Uh, so, uh, and... You know, uh, then after that, uh, the tradition largely continues to modern times and uh, different government, different uh, uh, dynasties, they've all largely sponsored it because it's seen as a secular sort of new year. Uh, even since I think Safari times, it was seen as a secular sort of new year and uh, everybody can sort of benefit from it uh, by sponsoring it because of its popularity and its... Uh, you know, uh, it's flexibility in many ways because it's such an old and varied tradition. And interestingly, uh, it's celebrated uh, in many, many different countries, in many, many different forms. Uh, it's celebrated in northern India, Pakistan by certain groups, in Albania, or even by Bekhtashi, I believe, uh, uh, order uh, who reside there. Uh, in Kazakhstan, in pretty much all of Central Asia, I would say they celebrate it, as well as Iran. But as a sort of a national holiday, Iran and uh, Iran has the longest continuous uh, break, which is two weeks. Uh, schools are closed for two. It's pretty much just like Christmas or you know, uh, uh, European Gregorian New Year. And then you have Azerbaijan, which is uh, they have five days off. And they celebrate it according to their own customs, with you know variations, and all that. Um, so yeah, that's a very brief and <laughs> generalized and non-specific history of you know uh, Nowruz. Uh, obviously, again, as I just said, very generalized. So I'm sure I'm missing a lot of things and a lot of details and all that. But I just wanted to give an overview that you know through ancient, medieval, and modern times, how it's changed.